is a point. Yeats is all about binary oppositions. His life was this interstitial space between ideas, whether he was Irish or English, whether he was most comfortable or happy in the rural world, in the countryside, or in the city, and urbane in that very genteel Anglo-Irish way, whether he steeped his life in art and separated himself from the world completely, or whether he had something to give to the community around him and how he could somehow synthesize the two together. His profound interest in mythology, at the same time as this burning desire, or burning desire, his gradual realization that he wanted to do something in Ireland for Irish people. Classicism versus modernity, insecurity versus conviction, the line, all those antinomies of day and night from the poem Vacillation. Antinomies is Yeats's word for binary oppositions. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Now. Of course, you go to all your, you, you, you dedicate your entire life to art, to the creation of poetry, of such precise sonic articulation. You build your legacy, and then some public sculptor. Um, gets the contract to do something like that. <laughs> dreadful, isn't it? Really, really dreadful. So, where are we? <sighs> yeah, Woody Allen said in Annie Hall, um, those who can't do teach, and those who can't teach, teach gym, and those who couldn't teach anything, well, they taught everything in our school. And I remember that because when I look back on my own education, there's a touch of that. I was in a classroom, various different teachers over a two or three year period, period would introduce me to poetry like September 1913, Easter 1916, among school children, and there was just absolutely no connection. This is the, the wonders of, this is brilliant now when you, you go Googling and you find your entire life. That's Belvedere College, that's the classroom where I would be looking out the window at the sky, and so would the teacher. <laughs> Everybody completely disengaged from the business of the poetry. So I was like, the teachers didn't care, we didn't care. And then an extraordinary thing happened. On the 5th of May, 1981, Bobby Sands died on hunger strike. I remember it, I can remember it vividly. This is where I lived, it's the Maple Hotel. I grew up in a small family hotel in Dublin. It was a Tuesday morning, and I came up out of bed about 7 o'clock in the morning, and my mother was standing there. She was serving breakfast. She had a plate of bacon, egg, and sausage in her hand. And she said, Bobby Sands is dead. And there was just that feeling of, oh, my God. This closer shot of the hotel. In 1970, blown through the front door of the hotel there by a bomb that went off. This bomb. That's the hotel there on the corner. It killed, 19, it killed 33 people. 1974. If you know about the history of Ireland, Ireland was the first English colony. It's also the last English colony to be returned. The north of Ireland is still under British jurisdiction. So there was a series of oh, attempted revolutions and rising. In 1916, the Easter Rising led to the War of Independence. In 1922, the Republic of Ireland achieved its independence. I grew up in the Republic. This is Dublin. So Dublin was relatively trouble-free, whereas with the rise of um, civil rights, particularly well in Europe and France and America in the late 60s, there was a rise of civil rights, uh, civil rights marches in the north of Ireland, then which led to the British government had to come in because it was fighting between nationalist paramilitary organisations, loyalist paramilitary organisations. Eventually the IRA wound up fighting a, a guerrilla um, war against the British army. And all this was happening until this Anglo-Irish ceasefire in 1994. Um, so on the day, on the morning that Bobby Sands died, Oh, sorry, a little more history, yeah. So, Bobby Sands went on hunger strike um, for, for the restatement of special status, which had been taken away. Spe special prisoner status indicated that basically you were a political prisoner. It meant you got to wear your own clothes, um, you got to receive and send post at least once a week. So, a number of prisoners went on strike. First of all, they, were, they had the blanket protest where they wore blankets, then the dirty protest, that is what you think it is on the walls, and um, which I suppose led inexorably to hunger strike. And Bobby, Stra Bobby Sands went on hunger strike. Two months after he began hunger strike, he died. So, that morning I went to school. I was like everything, everything normal had been thrown out. There was some, some guys in my class were wearing 
A history teacher came in, his name was John Connell. He came in and he tried to throw out Peter Ryan because he was wearing an armband. Peter Ryan says, you can't throw me out of class because I'm wearing an armband. And then Fergal Shevlin, whose father had actually defended IRA members in court, said, yeah, legally you can't do that. So John Connell, the teacher, went to get the headmaster. And we could hear them in the corridor having an argument about how the headmaster was saying he couldn't support the teacher in throwing out the student because of this. And, there was a re and in the background, there was just the sound of a black Mariahs who were going downtown in their droves because spontaneous riots were breaking out. Went on, nine other um, prisoners died on hunger strike, ten in total. Eventually, the impulse, the riots stopped. And a month later, that's the GPO, a month later, I'm studying for my leaving cert. And I'm looking at these poems, right? In 1916, school teacher, tax accountant, a group of ordinary everyday people went into the General Post Office and they declared a proclamation of the Irish Republic and that they wouldn't be leaving the General Post Office until England returned Ireland to Irish people. They were summarily arrested and they were executed. And Yeats had written a poem about it. He wrote the poem, Easter 1916. And now this is, I'd go to and from school every day. I'd walk past the GPO. I knew the story. I knew the story, but it, it was something that had happened in the distant past. Um, this is Sean McDermott Street, which is just up the road from the hotel. This is a shot from the period. It's called Sean McDermott Street after Sean McDermott, who was shot and executed. Um, he surrendered this day I found out when I was doing my research, the 29th of April, 93 years ago. The street was named after him in the 1940s. So I'm sitting alone in my bedroom, reading this poetry that really I'd never connected with. I came to that line there, this line about, for England may keep faith, all that. And suddenly, out of the blue, I heard this voice. I heard this voice in my head. I heard this anger, this frustration, this... I heard the articulation of the feeling I had had that morning when I went to school. And I heard William Butler Yeats. And there's probably something on the way to me becoming a literature teacher. I have met them at close coming with vivid faces from counter or desk among grey 18th century houses. I have passed with a nod of the head or polite meaningless words or have lingered a while and said polite meaningless words and thought before I had done of a mocking tale or a jibe to please a companion around the fire at the club, being certain that they and I but lived where motley is worn. All changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. When will that suffice? That is heaven's part, our part to murmur name upon name as a mother names her child when sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. What is it but nightfall? No, no, not night, but death. Was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith with all that is done and said. We know their dream, enough to know they dreamed and are dead. And what if excess of love bewilder them till they died? I write it out in a verse. Macdonough and Macbride and Connolly and Pierce Name to be wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born.